Panorama, which this week reports on the worldwide war against AIDS. Certain scenes in the following film are sexually explicit and could offend some viewers. Tonight, Panorama reports from the key cities on the new front line in the worldwide war against the AIDS epidemic. From Sao Paulo, here in Brazil, where government inertia has allowed AIDS to run out of control with alarming consequences. From Munich and Bavaria, where excessive official intervention threatens to destroy the balance between the rights of the individual and the public interest. From Minneapolis St. Paul, where the Americans think they've worked out how to manage the AIDS epidemic in both an effective and humane way. the haunted, accusing face of a dying AIDS victim. She's only 19 years old, but medicine has failed her. She is the latest casualty of the worst infectious disease epidemic this century. This month's summit meeting of world leaders has reaffirmed that AIDS is now one of the biggest potential health problems in the world. But it's not just a health problem. The epidemic is also spreading a new controversy that affects us all. It's about the growing conflicts between balancing the needs of public health with civil liberty. How drastically should the state intervene to contain the deadly epidemic? And what happens when the rights of the individual are threatened in the greater public interest? Brazil is the second most AIDS-devastated country in the world. Lack of government action is allowing the epidemic to run out of control. Sao Paulo, with 15 million people, is the engine of Brazil. Here, the world's biggest car makers have their South American factories. It is a city of dynamic growth, surging prosperity, low unemployment, but in too much of a hurry to give careful thought to the sinister new epidemic. The result, more people have AIDS in Sao Paulo alone than in the whole of Britain. Two years ago, government took the view that AIDS was not a priority. But this year, the AIDS figures in Sao Paulo will increase by 200%. I can say to you, uh, after 21 years here in Sao Paulo as bishop, that Sao Paulo is really a sick city. Everywhere you will find people asking you for help. annual carnival and the traditional expression of the average Brazilian's fascination with the form and sculpture of the lower back, focal point of a sexually uninhibited nation. Bisexuality is a national characteristic and was socially acceptable until they discovered how AIDS was being transmitted. A third of Brazil's gays are also bisexual, helping spread the infection to heterosexuals. A federal media campaign to warn against AIDS, miserably underfunded and shown too late at night, was a predictable failure. A frank poster campaign pushing condoms failed too, in the face of objections from the conservative wing of the Catholic Church. The Sao Paulo AIDS program director is fighting the epidemic without enough money, staff or federal government help. Dr. Paulo Teixeira knows there are at least 100,000 people in his city infected with the AIDS virus yet the bureaucracy denies him the basic tools to fight back. Dr. Tashira has no epidemiologist charting the precise course of the epidemic and no computers to make the necessary predictions. He's also in charge of running South America's only AIDS-dedicated hospital, but because of the fear and ignorance of the local nurses, half the beds remain empty. He's only been able to recruit enough staff to run 37 out of 65 beds, so the city is now in the position of having only a total of 173 AIDS beds, but over a thousand AIDS patients. 
As a result, men and women are paying to die in the shabby guest houses on the outskirts of the city, and the epidemic continues unchecked. I believe it's out of control now. Until they start doing something, it's out of control. It's spreading and no one's really trying to do anything about it. The cases are occurring more and more and more all the time. And there'll be more people who are infected through blood transfusion and uh, it's not being stopped. Why is there such a lack of federal government control? I wish I knew why there was so little interest. It's been very, we've been trying to get the, the government to take firm action and they really have been terribly slow to do anything. At Brazil's main medical research centre, British-born Dr Peggy Pereira works as the Health Ministry's scientific advisor on AIDS. She's fought unsuccessfully just to get mandatory blood screening introduced. One in every 500 people here given a blood transfusion get the AIDS virus with it. When I came last year and brought up the question of the blood transfusion, they said it wasn't a priority. I couldn't believe my ears. You know, it seemed to me such a, uh, a first thing to be dealt with before you started anything else. But they said, no, education is what we will be doing. But even basic AIDS education is in disarray. The Catholic Church has split between those strongly opposed to condoms or preservatives, as they're known, and those who say the epidemic's too serious to bow to dogma. The Cardinal Archbishop of Sao Paulo is one such man. What would you then say to a married man who comes to you for advice, supposing he's bisexual, and he says, I want to take my wife to bed, I have the AIDS virus, I want to take her to bed, the only way I can stop giving her AIDS is to use a preservative. What would you say to such a man if he came go, to the Go to the doctor, go to your doctor, and if your doctor and your wife and you have a mind about, eh, form your conscience about, you can do what your conscience is say to you. But not the church giving rules for everybody. Eh? It's the uh, conscience that's important in there. Sao Paulo's economic miracle is fueled by cheap labor drawn from the slum-dwelling favelas that cling to the hills around the city. AIDS is still a middle-class disease, but the time bomb is ticking under everyone. In some months, it will be around the city, and the very poor class, and then it will be terrible, because no one passed the tests of uh, blood giving and so on, huh? and that will be terrible. For some, it is already too late. They are beyond caring. Yet as they die, their deaths become statistics that give birth to new fears, making even reasonable men succumb to a climate of deep foreboding. It's really very serious. And, uh, but the Brazilian government, the officers and, and the Minister of Health, does not give a priority to these epidemics in Brazil. That's the reason we, the perspectives are catastrophic for Brazil and as an extension for the third world will be catastrophic. Onde cumprir a pena por um crime exatamente igual àquele marginal não fará mal para... Broadcaster Afanasio Jezachi is reliving a transmission in which he tells how an alleged child rapist was lynched by a vengeful mob. He loathes homosexuals too. Those with AIDS, he says, should be shipped to Brazil's old leper colonies for detention. His hate radio transmissions might have less significance were it not that he's just been elected a state congressman with a huge majority. Sao Paulo's morning newspaper graphically recorded the consequence of the growing AIDS panic with these drawings of a murderous attack on transvestite prostitutes blamed by the hard right for the AIDS epidemic. At 10 minutes to 11, one day last May, a man drove a Volkswagen slowly through the city streets. Weeks earlier, the police had launched Operation Tarantula, ostensibly to arrest transvestites. 
In fact, they were simply beaten up by the police. The police chief in charge said AIDS was not the problem for transvestites, it was the solution. The car slowed as it approached transvestites soliciting at a street junction. Fire from a 9mm machine pistol raked the group. The weapon is commonly used by military and civilian police. This was only one of five similar attacks. When it was all over, one transvestite lay dead, four were seriously wounded. For the victims, it was a terrifying and crippling experience. However, the bullets were small enough to pass through the body without causing death. All the victims will be scarred for life and remain a target for the city's illogical panic. In this anarchic atmosphere, Sao Paulo's transvestite prostitutes have been driven into a slum collective near the city centre, huddled together for protection. All the people in this house are young men, all sell sex professionally. Their leader is an older transsexual called Brenda Lee. Brenda is a sort of one-man private health department, housing, feeding and organising youngsters in his care. One sleeping transvestite had been beaten up by his client. Brenda showed me the Dickensian circumstances to which they've been driven. These are the very people who most need official help, medical and emotional, if AIDS is to be halted. Tragically, nearly all these simple and childish young men already have, or soon will contract, the AIDS virus. Without education and treatment, they will simply continue to infect others who, like them, will die. But instead of official protection, they get only official persecution. Aconteceu que se nós já sofremos muitos massacres, esse foi um dos piores, dos últimos que nós, que nós tivemos, né? Então o policiamento estava muito forte, muito rígido, levava, é, massacrava, prendia, não soltava, alegrava que era uma ordem do secretário de segurança, né? E na realidade é que além de eles prender, eles torturavam, quer dizer, massacravam, batia mesmo, chegou alguma a ficar bastante ferida, né? e eles ameaçando de ficar 30, 40 dias, e a gente sem saber qual era o motivo, qual a razão de tudo isso. Sao Paulo remains a warning of what can happen when government is overwhelmed into inactivity by the AIDS problem. Historically, in an epidemic, the people turn first to medicine. When that fails, they turn to the law, and when that fails too, they turn on themselves. Government zeal in trying to control AIDS can do as much harm as government inertia. He is a 46-year-old German nurse, painfully dying of AIDS. She is a 30-year-old print worker who's just developed the first AIDS symptoms. He limps because his leg nerves have begun to atrophy. Soon, gangrene will begin to develop in his foot. He is shunned by family and friends because in Bavaria, AIDS is treated like the plague. She was told she had the virus two years ago, but still remains terrified of telling her family, her employer, or her landlord. Since the death sentence was pronounced on her, she has maintained sexual and emotional abstinence. But government, in trying to control her, has simply driven her underground. We need control measures to help people to prevent further spread of the disease and I think we should consider that people being dead cannot execute personal rights anymore. We need to have better control for the disease even if we have some response from outside the country that we are dictatory or we are Nazis. We have to take care for our people. We have to save their lives. And we should not care what other people think about this. Munich, the capital of the state of Bavaria in the Federal Republic of West Germany, a prosperous and healthy city. 
its super clean streets house fashionable cafes where the satisfied contemplate a pretty good life. Unkind critics may call Munich the bourgeois capital of southern Europe, but the tradition is conservative and Catholic. And when it comes to AIDS, well, there's always the law. Even the police have become involved in the AIDS public health issue. They'll be expected to help implement the laws Bavaria intends to apply. The state of Bavaria is interpreting existing federal German health laws to mean that everyone suspected of having the AIDS virus must take the AIDS blood test. Those who refuse can be forced to submit to a test. All applicants for civil service jobs must be AIDS tested. Foreigners with the AIDS virus can be deported. All prisoners, even those still innocent and on remand, must take the AIDS test. Bavaria is also proposing that all those with the AIDS virus must tell their sexual partners. Proof will be sought. Anyone who deliberately or through negligence transmits AIDS will be dealt with by the police with the utmost seriousness. Hans Zettmeyer, Bavarian Minister of Culture, has publicly described AIDS as the symptom of a decadent society. Homosexuality, he said, was against God and nature and bordering on pathological behaviour. Homosexuals were a fringe that must be thinned out. And the minister is no odd man out on the subject of AIDS and homosexuals. Full support comes from a much more powerful state official and the real architect of the Munich laws. Dr. Peter Gauweiler, state secretary at the Ministry of the Interior. This ambitious 37-year-old is known to his many enemies, socialists, liberals, homosexuals, as Black Peter, the Bavarian bogeyman but he rather enjoys his notoriety and admits a certain admiration for the mad King Ludwig II of Bavaria, the sovereign described as having a whim of iron. However, Galweiler knows better than anyone that no one ever lost votes being a hardliner in southern Germany. An historical accident has left his interior ministry in charge of the Bavarian health ministry. It's as if the home secretary ran the DHSS. The result uncomfortably mixes welfare with law and order. We come to the Ergebnis that only uh, public relations activities, die weich sind, die angenehm sind, die viel Beifall von allen Seiten bringen, dass solche Aktivitäten allein keinen Erfolg gehabt haben. Unsere Verfassung, das Grundgesetz, gibt dem Staat die Verpflichtung, wie es dort wörtlich heißt, zur Bekämpfung allgemein gefährlicher und übertragbarer Krankheiten. Um ein anderes Beispiel aus dem Strafrecht zu bringen, kein Mensch käme auf die Idee, dass wir die Vergewaltigungen, die wir jedes Jahr in tausenden von Fällen haben, deswegen nicht bekämpfen sollen, weil es sich um Verbrechen handelt, die sich im intimsten Bereich der zwischenmenschlichen Beziehungen abspielen. Bavarians generally approve the tough political line taken against AIDS sufferers. They remain unconcerned that their views aren't even shared throughout Germany. They point out with satisfaction that even the Soviet Union has begun deporting foreigners who have AIDS. Nevertheless, for the Bavarians, this tough attitude is destroying any cooperation between the state and AIDS sufferers and high-risk groups. The implications of that include the prevalence of ignorance and prejudice about the epidemic. Working scrupulously within the law, Bavarian policemen are increasingly involved in AIDS-related health checks. No matter how discreet their presence, the association between AIDS, vice and criminality is unfortunate. Munich's prostitutes are grouped in functional caravans in a park near the woods. Typically, Munich wants and licenses the girls, but sweeps their business under the motorway and out of sight. The prostitutes, like their Brazilian transvestite counterparts, are a high-profile target for nervous hardliners. But they hardly constitute a major health risk. No one does business here unless they indulge in very safe sex. The result? Only seven girls per thousand are AIDS virus infected. 
but that doesn't stop persistent and pointless police checks of the girls, which do nothing to combat AIDS. This was one of a handful of homosexual frequented saunas in Munich. Some people may have come to lose weight, but most came for sex and didn't disguise it. The sauna was forced to close after the city authorities decided it was a public danger because it promoted the spread of AIDS. Today it's a small, intimate hotel. And it's still managed by the same man, Walter Wimmer. He says it's crazy to have closed the sauna because most of the old crowd are now back on the streets, in parks and public toilets, placing innocent people at risk. He's angry about the civil rights implications too. Warum ist so ehrlich? Bin ganz einfach. Weil wenn ich sehe, was Gauweiler macht, so solche Leute waren doch im Dritten Reich schon. Wir haben ja solche ähnliche Leute oder sowas im Dritten Reich gehabt. Allein diese Aussprüche von Herrn Zehnmeier, dass man äh, diese Leute, speziell Schwule, ausdünnen muss. Das sind Sätze, die man im Dritten Reich gehört hat. Wenn ich heute Videofilme sehe oder Filme aus dem Dritten Reich, genauso hat man geschrien oder solche Sätze, solche ähnliche im Dritten Reich gebracht und das ist gefährlich. Und was Herr Gauweiler macht mit Schwule einschüchtern, nur einschüchtern zu wollen, ja, und er allein die Macht hat in Bayern, das ist ja wirklich zum Schämen, wenn man dann Deutscher ist und in Bayern wohnen muss, hier speziell in Bayern ein Mann machen kann, was er will, Gesetze schaffen, die wo andere in Bonn dagegen sind. Da muss man schon sagen, wo sind wir? Sind wir 1933 oder schreiben wir 1987? The law on handing out condoms is so stringent that the local AIDS help group decided this Easter to try to circumvent the problem in an unusual way. They made and sold to gay bars in Munich some special Easter bunnies. Inside each one was a little packet, an extra Easter gift for those who might need it. But Bavaria's public health traditions have not always included high fuss. This institute, founded by Max von Pittenkofer, is now the city's leading medical research clinic. He was the 19th century founder of European medical hygiene, pioneering modern sewage systems, and he taught the then sovereign nation of Bavaria how to fight cholera epidemics. But today a new order pervades the institute. Professor Fresner believes in compulsion when dealing with the modern epidemic of AIDS. He wants mandatory mass screening. We did such uh, testing for tuberculosis very efficiently. We do this with our cars. Every two years they have to be tested by some mechanics. Uh, it's a law in Germany and nobody reviews it. The people Re are not cars. Yes, I know, but uh, the life is the most precious good. And therefore we really have to enforce such measures. This is much How would you enforce it? You could have a big number of things. For example, you are registered at your place of living in most European countries. And uh, you get no passport if you have no test result. Or you do not get some uh, social security card. Also, it's very easy to uh, make testing mandatory. The state would punish you one way or the other. Yes, there is no other way to uh, enforce such law, but it's for the benefit of the community. Thousands of lives would be saved if we really enforce such a mass screening program. But his boss, the director of the institute, believes that consensus must triumph over compulsion. In my opinion, it is not a wise movement from a scientific point of view because, to my mind, it will not achieve what the people who want to do it hope to achieve. Uh, our strongest weapon is uh, the trust of the individuals we want to reach most, the risk groups. If we lose the trust through any legal measures which they interpret as being taken against them, we lose control of them. We lose the possibility of voluntary testing which is obviously the most sensible way of doing it, and we do not have anymore the opportunity to counsel them as well 
as we do it today because they go underground. We're told again by, by the high-risk community in Munich that AIDS has effectively gone underground and the very people that you, the medical yes. people and the epidemiologists should be in contact with, you are missing because they're frightened of even yes. talking to you. Yes. Does that worry you? Yeah, uh, this could have been ex expected. Uh, and therefore, because of this situation, mass screening is the only way to deal with the problem. But they're not, you're not even going to find them if they've gone underground. No, if you do a mass screening of the total population, you find everybody. How can you? These are people who have vanished from their homes, from their lodgings. Oh, there are not many people without any homes. These are only very few terrorists in Germany which cannot be traced. And these are not important for the spread of AIDS because they have no contact to the normal population. You'll find these people whatever it takes. Yes, that's no problem. For Bavaria's public health department, the political pressures to get tough in the fight against AIDS has produced tension between managers, their social workers, and the high-risk groups. The senior doctors, however, are towing the party line. Als Arzt des öffentlichen Gesundheitsdienstes muss ich demokratisch beschlossene Gesetze und Bestimmungen vollziehen. Und dazu bekenne ich mich, sonst würde ich einen anderen Beruf ergreifen oder würde in einer anderen Dienststelle arbeiten. One unpleasant side effect of Bavaria's hostility towards AIDS sufferers has been the telephone calls, often anonymous, to the public health department denouncing people allegedly transmitting the virus. I asked Dr. Loffelholz how she would handle a serious allegation. Then I have to the police in the interest of the health. But the department's own social workers are in rebellion about this, as details of a confidential report reveal. The report is a stinging attack on the way in which the Bavarian Interior Ministry and Health Department are handling the AIDS epidemic. In our experience, the climate of trust between helpers and victims has been seriously disturbed. The social workers said they were detecting a new hostility and aggression towards homosexuals amongst working-class youngsters. Some of these youths even wanted AIDS victims publicly branded on their faces. We are worried that there is a tendency towards discrimination by the public against all social minorities as a consequence of the repressive combating of AIDS. The main author of that report is senior social worker Rainer Albrecht, who works at street level with homosexuals and drug addicts fighting the AIDS epidemic. I can see and I can feel that the atmosphere has changed in the last few months, very intensively, very, uh, in a very bad way. Uh, it's um, an atmosphere of fear, of uh, repression, of uh, discrimination, and a lot of people there, and it's a, uh, a way to say that they are gay, they, uh, they want to be just normal people, they are afraid of going to bars, to gay bars, they are afraid to um, have their coming out as young people, something like that. I think that's very really significant. But for the stricken victims of the epidemic, any debate on social control is coming too late shunned by those who instinctively believe in retribution for sinners and seek supporting legislation, they are already disappearing underground beyond help. But who really cares? Die Behauptung, dass dadurch Menschen in den Untergrund getrieben werden, gehört zu den äh, frommen Märchen, mit denen eine wirkungsvolle Bekämpfung von Aids seit langem zerredet wird. Um welchen Personenkreis geht es bei behördlichen Maßnahmen? Stricher, männliche Prostituierte, Dirnen, Fixer, Drogenabhängige, Sträflinge, das mit oder ohne Aids klassische Klientel unserer Gesundheitsbehörden. Wohin wollen die abtauchen? Die sind schon ganz unten. My advice to Dr. Gauweiler would be to give us his tremendous energies uh, into the right direction, friendly persuasion, education, in order to solve the problem in a medically sound way.
Minnesota, like Bavaria, is a clean and prosperous state too. It shares Bavaria's fertile agricultural background. Many of its citizens came originally as immigrants from Germany and from Scandinavia. It has a European feel to it. And like Bavaria, the people here are healthy. They live longer in Minnesota than in any state of the Union. But when it comes to fighting the AIDS epidemic, any comparison with South Germany ends abruptly. Minnesota probably leads the world in the enlightened management of the AIDS epidemic. It has neither too many laws like Germany, nor too few like Brazil. It's created a unique program based on compassion and help for the vulnerable, while still protecting the interests of the public at large. The whole reason that we don't have AIDS hysteria, which then compounds itself into preventing us from doing the good public health we can do, is by targeting even those who aren't at risk, so that they know what is the risk, how is it transmitted, what can we do to prevent and what can't we do. Indeed, the Minnesota Public Health Department's attitudes fly in the face of a new federal hardline approach. President Reagan has just succeeded in getting congressional agreement to have all potential immigrants to the U.S. tested for AIDS and barred if found positive. However, unlike Brazil, Minnesota has the technology and it also has an epidemiologist who takes responsibility. The problem we have, though, is, is that we are experiencing right now the silent epidemic. The silent epidemic is one where virus transmission is going on rampantly now, but the number of cases that will occur as a result of that transmission won't be for another four or five or six years. When there are five funerals a day in Minneapolis and St. Paul, then people are going to say AIDS is a problem. They're going to want to do something about it. And right now we have data on gay and bisexual men from the Gay Pride Festival. That's mostly been collected from the Minnesota AIDS Project. And then we've also been... Osterholm's you know, first tactic has been to recruit and involve all the doctors, bureaucrats and civil rights groups who have an interest or part to play in the AIDS epidemic. Absent by request or any policeman, they've been given no role to play here. Osterholm doesn't make laws, he drafts protocols and leads meetings to agreement. Every meeting is reassuringly open to the public. The process is known as the Minnesota model and is evolving with clear goals. And then the hemophilia study is, is almost completed. The Minnesota model aims to determine the extent of the epidemic spread and investigate precisely how it's being spread. Develop outreach programs that find and then help those most at risk by helping them change their behavior. Educate the public in a way that curbs AIDS hysteria, and always use consensus over compulsion. The inoffensively named Red Door Clinic, people who think they may have AIDS, come here first for testing and then, if necessary, for advice. The atmosphere is so relaxed that people like this young lady are prepared to pop in on their way home and take the test. It certainly wasn't compulsion that brought her here. Well, there was um, an ad on TV. They were talking about AIDS and saying that, the, that free tests were available through the Red Door Clinic. And um, it was something I'd been thinking about for a while. Um, I have a past that's probably a little more active than I wish it were. And there's a lot of things that I don't know about the people that I've met. And I'm worried about it. So I thought, well, one way to know is to get the test done. Then I can either forget about it or at least be careful from now on, or if I do find out that I have it, that'll make me make different decisions than I'll make if I don't have AIDS. When he's, when he's mad, mm -hmm. when he's upset at you, mm -hmm. who does he want to talk to? If the AIDS virus test is positive, you know. the victim will be counseled by this gay psychologist. He must, at this difficult time, maintain calm but also coax from the stunned patient the names of others who are now at risk. Would you be willing today at all to talk about it, or do you want to just kind of stay away from it entirely? No, I'll talk about it. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the reasons I press that point is that, you know, in my business, I get the unfortunate opportunity to see a whole lot of people who kind of put off that issue right. and end up feeling bad about it. Well, I feel guilty. 
Oh, I have yeah. reason to feel guilty, you know. But that's about as far as I can take it. And then so I'll, I'll talk about what happens when, when you say that's about as far as I can take it. What? I don't know. Do you have any sensation of what would reduce that guilt? What would relieve that guilt? Two people should be contacted. So you're real clear about that? Oh, yeah. No question. Right. Oh, okay. So you already got that in mind real clearly. And then the question becomes how to do that? Or if to yeah. do it, or when to do it, or who cares? Oh, you know? Sounds like you do. Like, yeah, I do. Consensus rather than compulsion? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Any sort of compulsory techniques are going to be counterproductive in the extreme. All they will do is drive this whole problem underground, it will elicit defiance and outright hostility on the part of the very high-risk individuals you're trying to reach. Instead, what we have found is, by and large, we treat people respectfully and elicit their cooperation, they will come through for us 100%. If I expect, however, that someone is going to go out and make a hash of it, by George, he'll go out and make a hash of it. This is an unmarked car belonging to Minnesota's public health department. Even the license plates are selected to guarantee anonymity. Steve, the driver, is an AIDS detective. His job is to help trace AIDS contacts very discreetly and warn them. I've met people in shopping center parking lots, at their homes, in parks, in my car, a variety of places. Um, for the most part, it's, it's wherever the uh, individual feels most comfortable. Steve's most delicate assignment is finding, then personally contacting, the large number of so-called closet gays, homosexuals, often married men with children, who dare not admit they are gay. This places their wives and loved ones at particular risk. But should the public health department handle that deeply intimate problem, and if so, how? So you have to coax him out. It's not a matter, I think, of even coaxing someone out at that point. Denial is something that isn't often broken by gentle tugging. I think there are times that it's, it's frankly a very cold fact that needs to hit someone squ square in the face. That can be done, I think, though, with a great deal of sensitivity. That can be done with all the fullest aspects of confidentiality. And that can be done in what has historically been uh, the public health approach. That's what we're attempting to do in Minnesota, is tie that together in such a way as to help that individual come to the realization of what risk they're at, for getting infected and what risk they're at of putting others at risk for infection. The State Health Department recognizes the inevitability of homosexual prostitution and reaches out to help the protagonists. Using streetwise social workers, it tries, as in this case, to help this youngster whose trade is pulling tricks, picking up men for commercial sex. Well, like pulling tricks and stuff, I just, I feel like it's more or less like, I'll take the chance, you know, and just, you know, I want the money. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, and it's more like surviving, you know, you're thinking about surviving more than anything else or your next meal because we, we haven't, you know, I don't eat that well. And it's kind of I know. <laughs> anything it's like I junk get. Food city. Right, right. <laughs> You've seen my place. <laughs> Chips and uh, Zozos and all kinds mm -hmm. of garbage. Mm -hmm. I know. Well, what do you think? See, I mean, I, you know, and I don't know whether you're going to want to try it or not, but I, I think you got to be thinking about whether or not you're putting yourself in a situation where you might risk it's going to kill you. I know. The counselor, he's with the Lutheran Social Services on attachment to the public health department, offers the usual sound advice to a man at risk to himself and his clients. Oh, my, get him some. But try them out. I mean, see what happens when you try and use them. But the city's greatest AIDS problem remains those secret homosexuals who, by denying the truth to themselves, their families or friends, are the most dangerous spreaders of the epidemic. They live in a twilight world of anonymous pickup joints or pornographic book and video stores.
This is one of the notorious public bathhouses in Minneapolis where men meet only to have sex. It remains open for if it were to be closed, the clandestine sex will simply continue elsewhere beyond control. It is not a place of happiness, but of sad compulsion. Those who still need to come here are driven men. Inside the dark and cheerless anonymity, individuals who have never met before and may never meet again pair off for lonely couplings. It was from the bathhouse institution that the AIDS epidemic first began its dreadful escape to Main Street USA and then the world. Some of the customers may be beyond education, but at least the management tries. Your locker is 60. If you want a condom, just let me know now and I'll give it to you now, or if you want one later, just let me know. Thank you. <laughs> Inside the cubicles, men wait silently for companions. The doors are now closed to reason and common sense, but sooner or later, these people must be reached too. They don't need society's pity, they need help. And that unenviable job is done by volunteer gay social workers from the public health department who trace the almost untraceable and then quietly talk to them. Very good for anal sex. We strongly recommend that people who are going to be doing that use a condom always. That you not uh, uh, leave it in your pocket and that you not leave it on the shelf, but put it on before you have sex. In Minnesota, it's still too early to predict success, but some small battles are being won for common sense and for public health. We've raised consciousness about sexual activity and risk. Um, several years ago, there used to be an orgy room here, which is a space where anything goes. That's gone. Um, people are much more careful about the activities they perform. Um, at one time, before AIDS, uh, people basically did what they pleased and their only concern was the usual venereal diseases. Those are still here, but uh, AIDS is, is uh, several magnitudes worse than, than syphilis or gonorrhea. Does the management welcome you here, or do, do the, they sigh with... The management has been extremely helpful and cooperative. Um, they've initiated many of the uh, changes on their own, they understand the nature of the threat of AIDS. Um, they've been happy to work with us. It's been a very good relationship. In one way or another, we're targeting every citizen in the state of Minnesota. And that almost starts from the cradle right up to, to the time of uh, uh, their last breath. In a sense, uh, our health department has always felt that every one of the citizens of the state of Minnesota belong to us, and, and AIDS belongs to all of us, and therefore, uh, all of us are going to be involved in it. an article by Tom Mangold linked to that program in Thursday's edition of The Listener.